Hunt for Greatness podcast. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Hunt for Greatness podcast. I got my boy Eric Williams over here. What's up, Eric? What's up, man? Man, we been, ain't, been a little bit. We ain't got nothing to do today, so it's uh, we got a big storm out here. Uh, I guess we're getting the tail end of that hurricane, Ian. Right? Isn't that what's going on here? Yeah, we're kind of getting the outside edge. Because it's supposed to move up like through South Carolina, up through Tennessee. So we're catching all the wind and rain. I think it's going to dirty up our water pretty good. For sure. I don't know if you have you looked at the surf cams? No, nah, but I figured it's probably going to dirty everything up and then it's going to be real hard to find fish. Probably probably hard to find bottom fish even. Yeah. Because it's going to be so dirty. I mean, maybe, it, maybe they'll be further out. I don't know. Yeah, I feel like during the pressure systems, all the fish move out to deeper water for safety. Because they know, they can feel when, whenever that, that bad weather is coming and they just vacate. Yeah, they feel that. Because that's why they eat pretty good beforehand. Mm-hmm. Like before the front comes through. Seems like anyways. If you can time it right, you can have some of your best fishing days before. And I mean slightly after a storm too yeah. if, you, if you have an area that is clean. It's definitely going to affect our fishing. Um, For probably a week. At least a week, and it unfortunately, probably in a negative way, it kind of, it seems like last year or year before last when we got a hurricane, it kind of spread the fish out, and it, every spot that I was catching them in no longer produced, so it was like restarting, starting over, and everybody's trying to find the fish again, and yeah, it kind of, uh, it creates another challenge for it. It messes up some inlets, too, like if we get enough of a certain direction wind, like I'm sure Carolina Beach Inlet's probably going to be a little sketchy for a little bit. Nobody's gonna really know which way to go and the markers and New River Inlet probably too where we go out on the big boat. We're probably gonna have a shift in the sandbar and that's things that you gotta be careful and look out for whenever you're, uh, whenever you get a, a wind that's blowing that hard. I mean, safety is, even like after the storm, it's like you have to be safe going in and out of them inlets. Not to mention all of the debris that's floating for a few days. Oh, yeah, especially the river. Yeah. In the river, Cape Fear River, you're going to have a lot of floating debris. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't, I don't have any plans for now. Um, it, we probably won't get any relief until Saturday night, and then the wind should switch offshore and start to flatten everything out. That's typically what happens. It's probably going to be nice in the next couple of days. Sunday is probably going to be awesome. But can you find the fish? That is the challenge, right? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the swell. Uh, you know, if we get the strong west winds, whenever it does pass, it'll knock that swell down pretty quickly, but probably not till Monday. I mean, Sunday, Sunday's going to be a lot of swell out there, but Monday should be decent. Now, I don't, I don't know how it's going to be if you get out like 5 miles, 10 miles, you know, how how that's going to change. I mean, I know that we're having a lot of current because of the storm, but I'm not really sure how that it does affect that deep water fishing like that. I'll probably just go ahead and drop this podcast as soon as I get it edited, maybe like the next day or two. Yeah. Just so people, it's applicable. Right. Just so people can watch it and be like, oh, okay, yeah. this way. But, but what we really want to try to focus on um, is Eric's new boat, and Eric's got a new boat, and he kind of tells a story on his YouTube channel, and I'll link the video below where you guys can go watch it. We'll, we'll talk briefly about the story of why he chose that boat. But this podcast maybe, hopefully, can help somebody in when they're shopping for a boat because we have experience with, I think we have experience with, like, you have experience. A bunch of boats. Yeah, you have yeah. experience with a bunch of boats. I've got three boats that I operate right now, so um, it could definitely help somebody in choosing their boat. So... You know, if you guys have any questions, comments, uh, anything like that, drop them in the comment section. That way we kind of know, did we miss something? Excuse me, is there something we can talk about that we missed? Or did we talk good about something? Y'all leave it in the comment section for us. But, uh, yeah, tell us about how did you choose this boat? That's that's a big thing for people. They don't know how to choose a boat. Well, I, I'll give you the quick progression. So I started off in a... Uh, 17 foot Key West dual console that that my dad actually when he passed away I inherited and that was a great fishing boat for like the sounds and everything but any chop it would beat you up because it's basically a a modified flat bottom I didn't like the dual console either because half the boat is basically closed off from being able to fish from if you try to fish with any friends you're right on top of each other so I knew then that that, that's not going to be a long term boat for me and I uh, didn't really have a lot of money. I was a teacher at the time, and 
I decided I wanted to get um, the river up style because it has a raised bow and works really well for uh, just safety when you're duck hunting. My uh, One of my best friends has a Winchester, which is the same style hull as the River Ox, but the River Ox has the raised bow. That's one of the things everybody comments on when they see it in person is how high the bow is. So uh, I got the River Ox, and, and I knew that that was going to be like a, let me figure out the saltwater game. I'm going to beat it up. I, it's fine. I don't care about knocking holes in it, um, chipping paint, yada, yada. And I knew eventually I wanted to get something bigger to start um, being able to push out 10, 15, 20, 30 miles. Uh, that's where this boat wasn't originally the plan. I wanted uh, something like a Privateer, Parker, Seahawk, Maycraft, something like that, uh, because they're known for just how tough they are. Uh, negatives to those boats is they, they're designed more for like the sound. They don't have a lot of dead rise, which was never a big deal growing up where I'm from. Everyone has those style boats, but you get down here you know, or into an area that's more ocean-oriented, you, you need dead rise because you have swell to deal with. And uh, that's a big factor is, is the swell has a specific period. Um, if it's choppy, you know, you can bounce on top of the wave action and whatnot. But if it's, uh, if it's more swell oriented and there's a longer period between the waves, you need something that's going to ride with it. And that, that bow is really important. So I wasn't always set on the boat that I got, but then I started doing the research and uh, I, I went out and my, my buddy Jordan got a um, Pioneer 197. And for a 20 foot boat, you can't beat that boat. It rides so well. Um, changed my life, honestly. I never would have considered the more uh, luxury style boats where they have all the bells and whistles and everything. But his boat changed my life. Going in your boat changed my life. You know, you, you're you able to... foot yeah. John Skiff, JVX. That's yeah. the boat Eric's talking about. And I, I never, I've never fished in the ocean with a, with a Carolina Skiff until <laughs> yours. And uh, that boat rides really well. And it has that modified V in the front to not... But, that swell down that's a more narrow boat too and that's really important that's one thing people don't talk about you you take your beam which that boat i just got it's got a, a almost a, a nine foot beam uh, that's the width at the the widest point on the boat a more narrow boat is going to ride a lot better because you you're able to just just cruise on a little bit yeah too, yeah and uh so I, really there was a lot of factors i knew i wanted something with dead rise um which is the Basically, the angles on the boat, uh, it has a 44 degree entry point, which is a pretty sharp entry point, so with a lot of flare, so it hits the waves and shoots out the spray. And then the back is a 19 degrees. Jordan's boat is an 18 degree dead rise, and I love his boat, so I said, Well, this has got a 19. Very similar. I'm in. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't necessarily the brand, which, which research and doing all the research, the um, Nautic Star is, it's not as. Uh, Sought after is like your Key West or your Tidewater or, I mean, Bulls Bay makes a great boat now. I looked at the 23 for a while. Uh, but it does have a composite floor, no wood, which is really important nowadays. And uh, it's designed for the angler in mind. And I have a ton of walk-around space in the back of that boat, which is really what sold me when I started doing the research. It does. It has a ton of space. When I went and looked at it, I'm like, wow. Yeah. So there's a lot of factors that went into me buying this boat, and of course price is huge. If he wanted fifty grand for it, I would have I would have passed. But I got it for a good deal. Uh, the boat has a lot of really great features that I love. For example, the live well in the back of the boat in the corner. It's not right behind the seat, taking up all your walking space, which a lot of your your more luxury brands they do that. They put the live well right in the middle of the boat in the wet. Um, that was a big factor for me. And then another is uh, it does have a rear seating that actually folds down out of the way. Super nice. Yeah. Super nice. So I, I had the, the idea of I'm getting this boat to fish with. I, I made my mind up I wanted 23 to 25. So this is somewhat of a, uh, I'm not, it's a compromise. You know, I'm compromising for a 22, but I'm still going to fish it like it's 23 to 25. Right. And uh, it, I do think that this is going to be enough boat for me to really learn that 10 to 20 to 30 mile range on the calm days. And if I'm ever in a situation where I need a bigger boat, which I don't think I'll ever be, that'll be a, a new conversation. But this is going to be a 10 year boat for me in my mind. I love that. 
Yeah. Uh, you said a couple of things. I just wrote a couple of notes down um, that may be important when people are picking a boat out. How important is it, do you think, for when you're first learning salt water areas to have a boat that you can kind of beat up a little bit? Like not to get the nicest boat possible when you're trying to learn how to navigate these waterways. Because you were saying... The river rocks, you're like, I don't care if you get scratched up and beat up. My first boat was a John boat, 14 foot John boat. And I thought it was important that, like, if I hit oyster beds, if I hit sandbars, it's really not going to mess that boat up. How important do you think that is? Uh, majorly. Uh, if you're, if you've got plenty of money and you don't care about, about that, get what boat you want. But if you're someone like us, a lot of people are yeah. like, just not rich. Normal yeah. People, yeah. I mean, Get, get whatever you feel safe in. I mean, the smaller the better for any of the creek fishing. If you want to chase reds in the shallows, they're going to be in 18 inches to 24 inches. You're not going to take that boat I just got in there. So I, I think it's very important to start with something that is uh, not as nice, just, just for the peace of mind. You know, well, when you're docking a boat, you yeah. know, you're going to bang it up if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, well, and, and if you're, you're passing through tidal areas, you are going to hit oysters. You're, you are going to smack the sandbars. I do it all the time. Um, you're gonna you're gonna have to learn how to drive a boat in tide. So like just docking alone in tide is hard. Yeah, you're gonna hit you're gonna hit stuff. If you want a sheep's head fish, you're gonna hit stuff, and you got to be on that structure or you're not gonna catch fish. That's right. So very important. Very important. Okay. Yeah. You said something else that I thought was important when selecting a boat. Um, you were saying that where you grew up, people really didn't need necessarily need boats like. The one like the Nautic Star. So, how important is it do you think to consider the area you're going to be fishing in when selecting a boat? Yeah, that's really important too. Uh, so, I, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. The Albemarle Sound. Um, the the bigger boats are your commercial fishermen. You know, they're out there crabbing. If it's three foot rollers, they still got to go to work. So they they fish a lot of like twenty five and up. Um, the dead rise is important for those days that it's really rough. But then again, like if it's too rough, they're not going to go because it'll just beat them to death all day. So really over 25 foot, you don't need a huge, you don't really need a big boat in a, in the Admiral Sound and dead rise is nice and all, but most days you don't need it. So you can get by with more of a flat bottom style. So which you do see a lot of the Seahawks and Maycrafts and, and they don't have the same amount of dead rises like the Parker deep bees and, uh, 26 Seahawk that has a fairly deep V, but um, if you're fishing the ocean and you want to go out in the ocean, you need either a raised bow or you need something that's going to cut waves because it's, and, and I've talked about this a ton, but it's not always the swell that gets you. A lot of times it's the other boats that fly by you, not really thinking about how their swell and their weight can affect you. Mm. So it's yeah. very, very yeah. important. Yeah, so you're, you're saying um, also you know consider the area you're going to be fishing but also kind of the style of fishing that you're going to be doing as well yeah because you're saying that you know you're not a star you're not going to take that back up in creeks so if you were going to do creek fishing a boat with a deep v you know a bigger boat probably wouldn't be the right boat for you no unless you're fishing at high tide only yeah you know, so you need to consider the style of fishing that you're going to be doing when you when you're because like say you want to get a, a mic like a, a a flat skiff you're only kind of going to be doing one style of fishing for the most part yeah because you're not going to run a flat skiff across Cape Fear River unless it's gorgeous because mm -hmm. you're going to take on a lot of water the gun walls are low you know it's dangerous it's really dangerous yeah and a lot of times when you buy a boat you don't buy a boat for the for the beautiful days you buy it for the safety okay what if i'm here and this happens and you say so you you bought the flat skiff and you got to get across the cape fear and you've only got six inches from the water line to or a bad storm comes up and it's just the what ifs are more important when really investing in a boat that's so true like considering the safety aspect because mother nature people people trash me all the time about taking the skiff out uh, as far as i do but, you know, we, I have probably five or six people that I'm like, hey, what do you think about the weather? Hey, what do you think about the weather? Are you going out? Are you going out in your kayak today? Are you going out in your little boat today? It's important to have other people in your network that run the same size boats as you to kind of, I can look at the forecast and be like, oh, yeah, I'm sending it, you know. But, like, communicating with other anglers, like, hey, are you guys going today? As a captain, it's very important. Like, had somebody trying to book a trip yesterday. I'm like, man. 
Like, it's blowing 20, gusting 30. I was like, I'm not running the trip. You know, I'm sorry. I was like, I'll call a couple other captains and ask them what they're going to do. None of them were running trips. You know, as far as in the ocean, too, it's important to have people, hey, you going out today? It's three foot swells every seven seconds. Or like, are you guys running a trip today? You know, and it's it's just important to have other people you can run stuff by and say, hey, are you going out today? Or Or it's important to have people like, oh, yeah, I'm going out to this wreck today. Oh, I'll be kind of in the same area, be on channel 69 or 13 or whatever. Like communicating with other anglers is important because we might think in our heads, hey, I can do it, I'm good, you know, but it's important to kind of take other people. Don't don't let ego drive you, you know, because yeah. I will sometimes. I'm like, I'm sending it, I'm good, you know. But that's kind of getting into other other stuff. All right, so as far as like how how do you know – you're getting a good deal on a boat nowadays because it's really hard. Prices still seem kind of high. It's really hard to figure out, hey, is this a good deal or am I getting, uh, you know, am I paying way too much for this boat? How did you figure out? I know you kind of know your boats, but where do you do your research? Where do you look? Where are you looking at prices of other boats before you bought your boat? The average prices for a 22 right now are in 40 to 50 grand. Um, that's slightly used, even you're looking 60 if you want to go new. Uh, a big thing for me, number one, is the hours on the motor. If I'm, and, and hours on the motor can be looked at from two perspectives. If it's a brand new motor and it's got, if it's a 2020, it's 2022 and it's got a thousand hours, that motor's been ran hard. Yeah. That's like our sea hunt. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, but if it's a 2013, which my boat is, and it's got 300 hours, it's sat a lot. So I knew going into that this boat that I'm probably going to have some motor issues, not because the boat hasn't been taken care of, but just because it's not used to being ran the way that you and I run boats. So from a, a price perspective, I looked at the hours and said, okay, it's got 300 hours. That means it's probably ran five, six times a year. Hard. That's good, good enough to keep it up. I like to run my boat at least once a month to keep the motor, you know, in, in condition that it's used to being ran. We don't have issues with fuel or anything if you go ahead and run it that often. The next step is uh, looking at the condition of the boat, and that's one that you, you can't look at pictures online and tell the condition of a boat. But what you can look at is look at the surroundings in the yard. So Chris, the guy I bought it from, First thing I'm looking at, okay, the boat looks great. What am I seeing around the yard? Because this is on Facebook. Okay, I could see like what truck he drove. I could see the house. House is on stilts. I know this guy's making good money. It looks like the water's in the background. Does he live on the water? And then like these are all really important factors because you can kind of put together a puzzle to create this boat. So then at that point, like I'm looking at, okay, it's on Facebook. This is the price. Um, how much action is it getting? Because Facebook will tell you that. I I saw the boat, it was online for 45 minutes and it had 26 saves. That means this boat's not going to be here tomorrow. Okay, so I so I put in my credit application. It took four hours to get it back. By that time, it had jumped to 35 saves, 36 saves, something like that. And then, like, I'm reaching out to Chris. I'm like, here's my pre-approval. I can get the loans good. Like, well, by that night, it was already at, like, 50 saves. And he's like, I got four people coming tomorrow. You're first. <laughs> so like, it, it, there's a lot. Of, it's like it's like real estate, man. If you price the the house right, it's gonna be sold within days. Um, so I and I knew, you know, I got the boat for thirty grand. You know, like I, I haven't really talked about that, but I could probably turn around and sell it for thirty five, thirty eight at least. Yeah, because you've seen it now. Yeah, and I've already done a lot of work to it that it needed. Which, and you know, there is value in that. You don't always get your value back, but I'm not going to sell the boat. I'm going to keep it for a long time, I hope. So when you're looking at prices of other boats to compare to the one that you're thinking about buying, it's important to consider those factors as well. Yeah, so for example, I've been looking at a sea hunt here in Wilmington. Uh, it's been on the market for a while. It's listed for 45. It's a 2016. It's got 150 hours. But I'm like 45 grand. I can't justify the down payment one and then making a $500 payment a month. I can't, I, it just doesn't make sense for me. 
So that's the only comparable boat in that size class in this area right now that's somewhat affordable. And it was 15000 more than the one yeah. you got. So it, there's a lot of stuff that uh, goes into knowing what value to apply to it, but I also like study that stuff, man, because I just love boats. Where do you study? I mean, you can, How do you study? You can look at Craigslist. You can look at Facebook. You can get on uh, uh, Boat Trader. You can look at... Um, and a lot of times it's funny, man, because I, I know I could do this as a business and be successful. I'll see a boat list on Facebook Marketplace, and it'll be bought within the day and listed on one of these boat uh, companies here in Wilmington for 10, 15 grand more the next day. It's cra- It's a big business. So, like, if I had been any slower on buying my boat, it'd probably be for resale right now for about 50 grand. Mm-hmm. So, it's just, if, if you want something, you got to pay attention to what's going on on all of your online stuff because... Deals don't last. My dad told me he was like, if you if you find a good deal, you better buy it today because it's going to be gone tomorrow. Very true. So I've lived by that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's definitely. I think all that information is super helpful if somebody wants to buy a boat. You know. Yeah, and if if it's been listed for two weeks, it's too high. You know. So do you think a lot of people are listing their boats for a super high price just? Uh, they don't really want to sell. It's just kind of like, if somebody gives me this, I'll sell it. Yeah. Do you think that's kind of maybe driving Yeah, here, here's a conversation I, um, one of my mentors in real estate taught me when uh, when talking to somebody that wants to sell their property. You, you say, okay, you know, what do you want for it? All right, you want this. Well, do you want to list your property or do you want to sell it? Because that's two different questions. I think a lot of boats are just listed. Yep. People are like, I'll, I'll, if I can get 50 grand for it, I'll let her ride. That's what I'm saying. But and realistically. Then you, and you don't, if somebody is just listing their boat and they don't necessarily really want to sell it, they just, if they can get 50 grand for it, they'll sell it. As, a, as negotiating from a buyer standpoint, you don't really have a leg to stand on. Because they're, I mean. Yeah. Unless you're willing to pay the money, you yeah. know, and, and take the, the L on it. You yeah. Know? It's like. Well, that's the thing too. You know, you, you buy your. I strongly encourage buying private party, which is what I did, because you're not paying all those dealer, uh, you know, markups. For example, say 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 I get hurt in a, a car crash next week and I I'm out of work for six months and I've got to sell my boat. I'm not going to lose money on it. But if I had bought it from a dealership for forty five, I'm losing money on it. Right. Yeah. And I, I'm upside down right from day one. So private look private party, of yeah. course. First, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, how long, how long, I guess it depends on the buyer, but how long would you look, did you look at both, you looked at private party and brand new, and you kind of made a pros and cons list, and the money was probably a difference. I knew that I couldn't do brand new, because I, I just, I'm not going to pay 60 grand for a boat. Yeah. You know, like not at this point in my real estate career, right. I'm still like, I'm very young, I've only been doing it five years, a lot of people would say, you know. You can afford it. Yeah, I can, but I don't want to put myself under that pressure of the what ifs. Right. So I knew that it, I could probably swing two, three hundred dollars a month, which is what my goal was get a boat for around that. And I still have the little boat too. So the plan is to keep that for my inshore stuff and duck hunting and everything. Yeah. K Pasa Amigos, quick message. If you guys drop a comment in the comment section, I'll choose somebody randomly to get one of these shirts love you guys hope you enjoy the podcast so as far as your new boat we'll talk about all right before we move on to this what i'm about to say as far as buying a boat did i miss anything that you think is important uh like if somebody's listening to this podcast and they're thinking about buying a boat or they want to know how do you select a boat is there anything that uh i would go ahead and plan uh the lending stuff out first so you need to f- find out where the money's going to come from before you even start trying to, to shop because you know you got to get approved for the loan first unless you're paying cash. And, and how can you jump on a deal if you're not exactly? Ready? So and I got lucky, man, because the lender got me approval for the loan within hours. I just wow. got lucky, and and I used Azure funding on Wrightsville Beach, and uh, it was it was flawless until the end. After I signed papers, they kind of got slack a little bit, but. They made their money at that point, so I, I get it. But um, overall, really good experience with them. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so get your money ready. Yeah, start out. start with your bank. See what they offer first, and uh, then start branching out. There's really not a lot of great boat lenders 
Um, looking online, there's some, but if you go to like Lightstream.com, the, the, there's there's all these caveats when using those big time companies for a loan. Like it, I do think it's better to go local, and that's the same way with real estate. If you can find a local lender, yeah, you may pay a little more, but you're also getting the perks of having that pool in the community, which is really important. I never even thought about that. Yeah. Yeah, Corn and Credit Union is where I got my loan for my, but I mean, it was let, you know half probably of what yeah. you borrowed, but it was still, like, that's still a lot of money to me. I'm yeah. Like going from a John boat that I bought for 700 bucks and sold for 1300 bucks, um, and I mean, I put a few hundred bucks into that John boat but going from a boat that was like a thousand bucks to a skiff that was sixteen thousand bucks was kind of was a lot for me like I had to make sure that I wasn't putting myself in a situation especially with two kids that this boat was going to take food off my table or you know getting my priorities in line as far as like financially like can I afford this is this going to stress me out because the stress is not worth it like just get something less expensive if that's if it's going to stress you out, it's not worth it to me, you know. And but but on the other hand, the John boat stressed me out on the water because it was breaking down and this and that. I had to get towed in, so I was more stressed about every time I put that John boat in the water. I was stressed: am I going to make it back to the ramp? You know, and that, it's not worth that stress either. So like maybe thinking about weighing it out, the stress to like what can I afford? You know, a lot of people live beyond their means, which is never good. Yeah, and another thing to think about piggybacking off of that was uh, there's a cost for getting bigger than you think you need. So, for example, the, I, in that River Ox, I can fish all day long for two weeks on a tank of gas. You know, 12-gallon tank. But this new boat, uh, it's going to cost me $10, $20 every time I take it out. For sure. Every single time. And it's still really good on gas for a big boat. Yeah. You know, so definitely considering the yeah. cost. And then if you're going to have a bigger boat, you're not going to be able to use the same tackle that yeah. you were using on a little boat. So that's another thing. Like if somebody's thinking about upgrading their boat, it's things to think about as far as do you have the rods and reels and mono and fluoro and tackle, you know, that you need to do what you want. Because you could buy a boat. Like when we got to sea hunt, we had nothing. So like we ended up spending thousands of dollars on rods and reels and you know it's just it, it's costly it's a lot more costly than just oh okay this boat's 30 grand i'm good yeah <laughs> nah you i mean does my trolling motor work for that yeah boat? Um, you know a trolling motor in, in and of itself is expensive because there, it's not just buying the trolling motor it's like do you want to onboard charger you got to buy batteries that are super expensive you know it's always more than what you think you know, taxes, fees, like it, you have to think about these things because if, if the boat's listed for 30 grand, you're probably going to have another five, six, seven grand in the boat, even if the boat runs immaculate. Yeah, I'm already I'm already experiencing that. I had to put hubs on it. Um, trailer. The tra- Yeah, the, the trailer. I put a spare tire on it, a spare tire mount. Um, I got an impact drill so that I can leave it in the car when I travel because, you know, you're talking a heavy boat. It's going to have possibility of blowing out tires or breakdowns uh trolling motor like you said that's something i want to do that's thirty five hundred dollars to to do it all uh it has the original uh screen in it so i would love to upgrade to a touch that's another two grand um just all the safety equipment the the garmin inreach that cost me four hundred dollars and fifteen dollars a month like it quickly adds up, and these are all very important when deciding what boat's best for me because if, if you have no intentions of taking it 20 miles offshore, then you don't need a 25-foot boat unless you just want to be the big dick bandit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, that's the truth to that. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, dude. I love that. So as far as somebody, we, we covered a lot here, in it, and I think it's um, it's great information like i we kind of came up with this on the fly when eric walked in the door we were going to talk about fall fishing we're going to do another podcast after this but you know i was like hey what's up with your new boat and then we just started talking like how do you select a boat that's a and then there's not many podcasts that i know of or conversations out there about how to select a boat and so many people are in the dark we didn't know what we were doing when you start and nobody does so it's it's so important you know to this is going to be a good podcast for people to listen to, I think, you know, 
but I think we covered a lot. We know we know we didn't cover everything, but I think we covered a lot when it comes to buying a boat. Yeah, and, and I'll, one more little tidbit is the bigger the boat, the harder it is to manage on your own. So that's something to really think about is, for example, this, this boat that I just got is not easy loading and unloading. I've already learned that. Like on and off the trailer. Yeah. Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah, and you, it takes some getting used to. Yeah. There's like, like that growing hunt, pains. That sea hunt still, I hate putting it on and off the trailer because it's been in a wet slip. I hadn't done it but like three or four times. And mm-hmm. I scratched it up bad the first time I put it on there. And I'm like calling Adam. I'm like, dude, I just scratched the hell out of your boat, dude. And I felt terrible. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like... Little things like that. It's not the skiff, bro. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. It doesn't yeah. move like the skiff. And, and like your your boat, your nautics car is not going to move around like the Sea Ox. You know what I mean? You get blown around by the wind, the Sea Ox a little better or a little more. Yeah. And, but there are some things that are easier, like docking, I think, is easier in a bigger boat. Yeah. I mean, it's easier for me to dock that Sea Hunt than it is to dock my skiff. And it only, only my skiff's easy because I've done it many times. Mm-hmm. But Yeah. Yep. And then thinking about, do you need one motor or two motors is another thing, you know, like everybody wants two motors because in case one breaks down, in case you're out there, but you're burning double the gas mm-hmm. and you're going, like you were talking about your boat gets about five miles to the gallon and our sea hunt at best gets 1.9, you know, two mile, two miles to the gallon at best, bottom paint slows it down. You get less mileage when you bottom paint a boat. Are you storing your boat in the water? Are you buying a boat that was stored in the water? You mentioned that. You were looking at that guy lived near the water. Mm-hmm. So what if your if your boat's been in a wet slip, or if the boat you're going to buy has been in a wet slip, it's taking a beating out there. I mean, yeah. it's just something to think about. Like where's the boat been stored? Mm-hmm. You know, and it's good to think about too. How long has the boat been? How much has it been ran? You talked about that earlier. So like, <laughs> for me, I look at a boat like a boat can be this is kind of dumb. And I hate to even say this because it's stupid, but this is how I look at it. Is a boat like in shape? It's like you go to the gym once every month. You're going to be super sore when you get out of the gym. You can, you're not going to be able to lift a lot. Is a boat, like you said, you run yours at least a couple times a month. I think that's important when buying a boat. When you go to any of these mechanics around here, they're like, you know, you ask most of them when you ask them, hey, when you're if you were going to buy a boat, would you want one with 500 hours or with 100 hours? And most of them are going to say, I'd rather have one with 500 hours, you know, because it's been maintained, it's been ran, you know, it's important. Are the are the person you're buying it for, are they doing the service on it when they're supposed to? Yeah. You know? That's all important. Just the quality of the boat. Say you find one you like and you, you look at it, is it beat up? Is it... You know, is it ch- there's are chips everywhere in the in the fiberglass, uh, scratches on the motor. Like these are all really important things to look at. Well, there are also signs of like how the boat has been. Does the owner care? Yeah, or do you just run the hell out of the boat. Yeah, the look, if you can see in his garage, what's his garage look like? Because if that's organized, this man keeps his boat up. Yeah, yeah, like Roger. Mm-hmm. His garage is impeccable, <laughs> and his boat is impeccable. Yeah, like Roger's boat is flawless yeah you know people that care about their stuff it's usually people that don't have a bunch of money for the most part i mean it's usually people that are like okay i have to take care of this this is all i got mm-hmm. you know so anyway i think that's a great i think we did a great podcast on how to select a boat yeah you guys go over to eric's channel um subscribe to his channel check out that video that eric made telling the story of his boat and it's more what how would you describe that video just uh raw Probably raw. Yeah. One take. It is what it is. And you can see the boat. I'll probably put yeah. the boat in this thumbnail, but you'll you can see the boat. You kind of do a tour of the boat. Yeah. As, break, break down everything. Yeah. Of the features and super cool video. It's a Nautic Star, twenty two foot. Yep. Twenty two foot Nautic Star. Um, it's got a one uh, one one seventy five Suzuki on the back. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, dude. I appreciate you talking with me about your new boat. Yeah, man. Can't you wait to get it out. Sell or buy yep. a house. Hit Eric up. He's a realtor at Nest Realty, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. So, um, anything else we need to plug? No, man. Can't wait to get out there and uh, and do some bottom fishing yeah. with it. Yeah. Oh, you guys go check out uh, Sportsman's Wholesale over here on Kerr Avenue. It's right beside uh, True Fit or TF Fit. Is it still TF Fit? TF. Uh, no, it's uh, Fit for Life. Fit for Life. They change change it every couple months, but it's right across. It's on Kerr Avenue, right across from. Uh, uh, what's the other gym? Planet Fitness. Yep. Right across from Planet Fitness. I mean, if you want to save some money, if you're trying to outfit a new boat, these guys are awesome. 
um, I went in there and talked with him for 30 minutes and uh, check that out. You can save some money that way. So maybe we should do a, a podcast about how to save money when you buy a boat because <laughs> we figured out a lot of ways to yeah. save. And it's tricks of the trade. Like it's things that, you know, you guys aren't just going to tell you. You got to pay attention. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like the gas situation and sea hunt that I'll talk with you about. Yep. And do your own maintenance. Yeah, do your own maintenance. There's videos about everything. But yeah. we can do a whole podcast yeah. about how to save money for sure. You buy a boat. Um, but you guys go over to Eric's channel, check his channel out, Eric Williams. You can type in Eric Williams Fishing because that's how I always find you on mm-hmm. um, YouTube. Eric Williams Fishing. Uh, Eric's got super cool fishing videos over there. Uh, but you guys, thanks for watching the podcast. Eric, thanks for doing the podcast. Yeah, man. I think we'll probably just go ahead and do another one after this. Sounds good. We're going to send it. <laughs> Love you guys.